So gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we come to you in prayer today to offer up our praise and our thanksgiving for your travel mercies that have enabled us to assemble from around the globe in this place at this time and for this purpose, your purpose. We are grateful for this opportunity to share information that we trust will equip the saints to deliver meaningful and inclusive services to children and to families. I pray that your spirit will guide us as we present so that we might do so in a manner that will have meaning and value and also offer encouragement to you, the listeners. And to those that hear, we pray that you will return home safely to your respective organizations and communities and implement the changes required to accomplish God's plan and purpose for his precious children, that we might not just be hearers of these words, but also doers, bearing fruit in his service and for his glory. And Heavenly Father, we ask that what we know not, that you would teach us, what we have not, that you would grant us, and what we are not, that you would make us. And we pray all of this in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Christ Jesus. Amen. My name is, my name is Lyle Halleck, and uh, I am going to be leading you through this journey on this path. And I'm really thrilled to have with me my wife as a co-facilitator, uh, and she's going to be doing some of the additional work and presentations uh, uh, today. Uh, as I mentioned, path planning is a tool that has been used successfully uh, for many, many years. And uh, for those who were at the session last night, you heard the comment, we hope too many people weren't uh, seduced to go to the session on the roadmap, because what you will find is that the roadmap session that WWO is talking about is very, very, very similar to the path planning pr principles and process that we are going to show you today. Just to give you a little bit more information on who we are and what we do, uh, I have uh, recently retired uh, after 38 years of services in social services in Canada. The vast majority of my services were spent working with children and adults with disabilities, and I worked in a variety of different positions uh, in a variety of different organizations, everywhere from working as a social work counselor to a program supervisor, a manager, director, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so it's been a real pleasure for me in this, the next season in my life, to have an opportunity to do some travel and some training with Kathy uh, through LAM International and Global Capacity Building Network. Hi, and I'm his better half. Sorry, sorry, I had to say that. Um, and my background, much like Lyle's, and true story, where Lyle and I met was working with children. We met working with dis children with disabilities with over 40 years ago, I think, now, over 40 years ago. And we have been so blessed to continue working together in the same organizations, either NGOs, government agencies, private agencies, and that sort of thing. I, too, am a social worker, but my background is more in the child protection side. So I was a government child protection worker, and my job was to keep kids safe. My job was to go into homes, assess how children were doing in homes, and make sure that they weren't abused, neglected, exposed to violence, and that sort of thing. And so I worked a lot with families, trying to empower families to do a better job at parenting their kids, preventing abuse and maltreatment from happening in the first place. And then if, unfortunately, children were not able to be safe in their own home, my job was to work with foster families adoptive families, and ensure that children, every single child, had a forever home. So that's kind of my background in, in doing work. So we've kind of covered the field in terms of working with vulnerable children, um, and not so much orphans, because in Canada, we're both from Canada, we don't have orphanages anymore. We used to, 
And if you ever want to have a conversation about some of our orphanages and our history of orphanages in Canada, it wasn't a very good thing. We did something what we called the 60 scoop way back when. I won't take a lot of time on that, but it's incredibly fascinating, where we went to northern indigenous Aboriginal agencies, our communities, and we literally scooped up kids from their homes, took them away from their family and put them in institutions because the belief was we could service and educate children better in institutions. And so we have created intergenerational trauma for generations of children who were taken away from their families, okay? Just because they didn't understand what was going on. And unfortunately, a lot of that trauma was done in the context of the church. It was Christian nuns, pastors, church people that went into these communities, didn't understand what was going on in these communities, didn't understand the culture of what was going on in these communities, and scooped all these kids out. So... You can imagine that in Canada, certainly where we live, they don't really like the church too much. Uh, so Lyle and I have to be very, very, very cautious and wonderful stewards so that we can build those relationships and start helping those damaged relationships that have happened. But that's a different story. And one day, maybe we should do a whole session on the 60 scoop. So anyway, sorry. But I think Kathy's point is very important. Uh, we've had the privilege uh, since we began doing some traveling with Global Capacity Building Network to train not only in Canada, but to train in Ukraine, uh, Kyrgyzstan, to train in Ethiopia. We've made several trips to uh, India to do training there. And one of the things that we are very cautious about in our uh, work in those countries is to recognize that uh, I'm a white guy from North America. And I'm probably not going to solve your problems in your country. But hopefully, with the years of experience and knowledge that we've gained working in our fields, that we might have some information that we can share with you that will be of, as I mentioned earlier, interest and value, that you can use some of these ideas to move forward with your agenda to accomplish the purposes that you have for children and families within your, con within your country and, and cultural context. Uh, one of the key things in the path planning process is, as we have on the screen, where there is no vision, the people perish. And so one of the things that this planning tool does is is very clear on establishing a vision. And we'll get into that quite a bit uh, as we move forward. Uh, this is, as Kathy mentioned, one of the principal planning uh, methodologies that has been used extensively in Manitoba uh, to deal with persons with uh, disabilities. Now, one of the very unique features of it is its visual representation. And as we go through the session today, you will see how this works. Now, one of the cautionary tales I am going to tell you about this session is that to do an accurate and thorough path planning session, it generally takes about three hours. We don't have three hours today. So we're going to give you the shortened version of this. We hope to be able to not only give you the process, but also interact with you. And so we're going to be asking you, as we do in all path planning sessions, to participate and to join in with us as we move through this process. So I hope you're prepared to do that. We would encourage you to kind of take notes because as we go through this, we want you to be thinking of how this might apply in the country or in the organization that you are working in. Yes, this can be used for individuals and for organizations and for multi-organizational purposes as well. One of the beautiful things about path planning is it is a future-focused planning tool. So it doesn't look like just where are we now and worrying about what, what kind of uh, challenges are coming at us and how are we just going to deal with those challenges day to day, but it really looks further on down in the future. The beautiful thing about this is you can define what length of time that future is. If you want to look at the future a year from now, you can do that. If you want to look five years from now, you can do that. If you want to want to look 10 years from now, you can do that as well. So you can define 
your future. It allows for input by multiple individuals. And Lyle, maybe what you can do while I'm just finishing this is we actually have a little bit of a handout package that we want to give to you that you can take away. Um, and it gives you a bit of the overview. It talks about the process that we're going to do here. So we're going to give you the kind of the theory of it. And then we're actually going to walk you through, as Lau mentioned, doing a path so that we're going to have it both head knowledge and practice knowledge in a short one hour and 20 minutes. So let's hope it works. Uh, it allows, as I mentioned, input from multiple individuals, not just one family, one NGO, one church, but multiple different people. It's done in a very interactive fashion. And I love it that it matches the roadmap of this uh, 2019 forum because it really does provide a roadmap or path for fu future activities that align with your vision. Many organizations in the years of, and many organizations that I've worked in, were very, very good at sitting down and writing vision statements and hopes and our dreams, but we're not always good at articulating the path to get to that vision. So it becomes, it can become disheartening and difficult and challenging and people can lose energy and fall away. The beautiful thing about using this tool is it's going to be very visual for you and it's going to keep you, the visuals, pictures say, a thousand words, it's going to keep you jazzed up. Um, it's, again, graphic nature makes it really memorable. And one of the things we really love is it's ideal for per people of all cognitive abilities and expressive language skills. You can use this with children. You can use this with adolescents. You can use this with people with cognitive mental health challenges, um, whatever, because a picture, as I say, whoops, uh, says a thousand words. So the benefits of the path, I think, is on your handout, so you don't need to necessarily click and take pictures, but although you're certainly welcome to do that, I'll go through those. Um, it builds a common understanding. Do you know when I say it puts us all on the same page? You, 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 the same, and it really does. It puts us all on the same page, and it helps provide support for an individual or a group. It also, one of the other beautiful things that it does is it involves many different, it can involve many different agencies, churches, NGOs, who there might be some conflict, there might be some oh, tension, that's a good word, uh, between various organizations. I don't want to share resources with you or I don't like you, I don't like the way you work. Doing a path is a really wonderful way of allowing people to share a dream and, and go to the North Star so that it brings us together and minimizes the conflict potentially. It's a great way to kickstart a pro uh, project or a program and it, um, at the end of the way, at day, as I mentioned, it provides and will help motivate you for the future. One of the things I love about this is you can do a path with six people, maximum 30. Like, we're really pushing it in this room. The smaller the group, sometimes even almost the better. And the key is to get the right people there at the right time, okay? So you want to do that prep work in advance to get the right people at the table to do the planning. It is um, one of the beautiful things. You can do this as, how many of you have done strategic planning in your organization? Like five years, three years, that sort of thing? Right. Okay, so you can use this tool as a unique strategic planning tool. Or if you've got an organization and you really want to focus on one part of your organization, you can use the path for just that one part. So, uh, for example, if you really want to beef up your foster care network within your program, you can just do the path related to the foster parent wing of your program. And we did that, for example, in India uh, with the Child Healing Center. They offer a variety of different uh, programs, but they decided they really wanted to concentrate on their training center. So we pulled together all the staff there, and including the builder, and he was there too. He loved it. He thanked us so much because the director of the organization thought, I'm going to bring the builder in so he can be part of this visioning, so he can see what we're hoping to, to literally build here. So it was wonderful. So you can just do the whole program or just pieces of the program. All right. And again, it's a lot of fun way of building team activities. So I want to show you 
three different visual examples of a path. This was a path for Johnny. Uh, Johnny was a young man living with a disability. And this, at the end of the day, and we're going to show you how we build this, this, we're going to create this. This is his path that is in his bedroom, on his wall. Every day he sees that. He lives in a group home with many different staff that come in and work with him. Staff come and go. They don't know Johnny. They don't know necessarily where he wants to go. But guess what? And Johnny can't always communicate it, but this path can up on his bedroom. They'll know then where, and of course you have to walk it through, and I'm, we're not going to walk that one through, but you can just see visually, wow, isn't that amazing? This is a path that's done for an agency. Uh, in, in Manitoba, it's an indigenous agency, their learning center. So a lot of theirs, or there are some words and there are some pictures. Again, there is no one set way of doing a path. It's really up to you and who you have drawing. I'm going to be the drawer today and I can't draw stick men. Um, so we'll probably do a lot of words on ours too. But if you've got uh, creative people in your organization that can come and draw, that's awesome too. And this, actually, remember that training center I mentioned in India, in Bangalore, if anyone knows, uh, the Child Healing Center with George Ebenezer and his team? This is the path that we created in um, Bangalore, and that was just for their uh, training center. So, And as you can see, each one of those little boxes were literally each one of these flip charts that they now have up in their office on their wall and they can see it, and it's there to energize them and help them stay focused on their plan So, and on their path. So there's a couple of things. If you want to be successful in this doing paths, do some pre-path pre activity. Okay, Do your homework. Um, find out who the individual is or who the family is or who the organization, and you know your organizations. Figure out who are the best people that you need to involve. And it could be some of the people you really like to work with, and it might be some of the people you don't like to work with. But maybe they need to be there at the table to do the planning with you, okay? So do some, um, some pre-work, decide where you're gonna do it, when you're gonna do it, make sure it's a good time frame. Please give yourself sufficient time, a minimum three hours, to really make it mean uh, meaningful. You want to send out letters of invitation. Um, you want to identify a process facilitator. Today, that's going to be Lyle. And you're also going to want to identify a graphic gu guide. That's me today. Okay. Now, here's the thing. If you are in charge of your organization, you are not necessarily going to be that process facilitator. Okay? You want someone as neutral as possible to do that because you, as the head of your organization, also wants to be actively involved as well. And one of the things that I found when you have the executive director or uh, the he head pastor or whatever, and they're drawing things down, they write their ideas down and don't always include everybody's voices. right? Or they take what some people say and put it in what I think it should be because I'm the boss, right? So, and you want to be part of the process. So that's why we're trying to create a whole pool of people that can do PATH. And we have that in Manitoba, that if you want to do PATH training, we have people like Lyle and I that'll come into your organization. We do our homework in advance, and we come and we sit down and we do a PATH for your organization. That's why everybody can sit down and be a participant. That's the best way to do it if you can, okay? All right, click, sorry, Lyle. All right, setting the room up in a semicircle, which we're kind of doing here. If you were doing actually, again, guys, that's on your handout, giving you the handout, the steps by steps there as well. You want to make sure that you discuss the process and the group guidelines. So if you turn in that handout package to page two, it outlines some of the guidelines that are really important for it to be successful. Okay. Um, taking uh, throwing away uh, luggage or garbage before starting, uh, trying to put aside all those past challenges or beefs that you might have with someone, take off the judging hats, be committed to the time. 
One of the worst things that I saw happen to a young man not too long ago was we got a lot of family members coming to his path and then his a very significant auntie that he wanted at the path came but ended up leaving before it was done. Devastating to that child. Devastating because for him it was done. He thought, oh, she didn't love me anymore, right? So if you're going to come, you have to stay. Sorry. Okay. All right. Anyway, and then you're going to follow the steps one to nine, which is right there. So let's go and do it. After you're done, though, you're going to want to do some stuff, and that's also in the handout package. You want to make sure that um, you're giving people a visual of it so they can either take pictures. You can take pictures. Um, before, it was very hard to do. We can do it now. You want to also send out reminders to people at the key juncture points to say, how's it going? At six months or one year, how's it going? Do you need some help? How can I help you and empower you? And of course, you want to celebrate success along the path. So are you ready to do one? Ready to walk through the process? I just want to note that this particular planning methodology is not Kathy and Lyle's. This actually was uh, developed by uh, Peerpoint and Forest. It's an old system. I think they started to use this like in the 1980s. So it's not new and it's not high tech and it's not fancy, but it is tried, tested, and true. And I think there's some value in that. You can also see that it is very high tech. We have used like nine pieces of paper, and we have used some markers and a little bit of tape. So if you're having to travel to areas within your home country or areas where you can't lug a lot of stuff, where you don't have a lot of high-tech resources, you can still accomplish this particular planning process without a lot of high-tech gear. I just want to point out, I didn't have it with me, but uh, you can actually go online and there is a book. It's called All My Life is a Circle by Pierpoint and Forest. It's put out by Inclusion Press. And they also have other planning models in there, including maps and the PATH session that we are going to be doing today. So without further ado, without further ado, we're going to take a little trip. And I'm going to need you to cooperate with me. I want everybody to close their eyes. Literally close your eyes. And I want you to imagine, here we are. October of 2019, and we're going to move forward in our time capsule. If you're a Star Trekkie on the Star uh, Ship Enterprise, if you're into Star Wars, you can use that as your analogy. And we're going to move forward, not one year, not two years, not three years, not four years, but five years into the future. You can now open your eyes. We are in October 2024, and we are going to establish the North Star. I'm not sure whether anybody knows about the North Star, but the North Star is the area where we use a point fixed in time to guide us on our path. So, we also need a title for our path, and so we are going to put that title up, and it is going to be creating a community without orphans. Does that sound like a viable goal that we'd like to work towards over the course of the next five years? Yes, we could do that too. This is our path. Which would you like? Creating a world. Okay. All right. So that's going to be our path, is we're going to work towards creating a world without orphans. You can see that uh, we've got a lot of pieces of paper. And what we're going to do, this process tends to be a little bit of a backwards planning process. And so we're going to hop back and forth, and you're going to see why. But at the end of this whole process, 
we're going to link all of the various steps, like links in a chain. So getting back to our North Star, we are going to, as we've done, look at five years in the future. I wasn't planning on holding this mic and working this. Uh, OK, we're good now? OK. Uh, so we've established that we are in 2020. And the question that we have to ask is, if we're going to build that world without orphans, what are some of the key elements that are going to show us that we are working towards our vision, the North Star? What would our hopes be? Would we like to see the number of orphanages either transformed or reduced? So transform, we're going to transform some of the existing orphanages and perhaps even reduce the number. Within that, are we going to see anything else? More which? More children in families. So we're going to have more children in families. Any other things that we might notice in 2024? Again, there we go. Greater family stability, less falling apart. So we're going to better support the family and the kids in those families so that we don't need any alternative care. That would be the best option, right? Okay. Other thoughts? Anything else that really jumps out? This is your path, remember. Thinking about your home and your organization, are there any things that you want to add to that that you would like to see accomplished by 2024? Ah, so we want to develop some partnerships with the church. So we want to strengthen relationships with the other agencies, the other communities within our home country. Any other thoughts? We want to have good leadership. OK, in the interest of time, we're going to leave that for now. If there's something that springs to mind, we can always add it later. But I'm going to ask you to jump back into oops, into the little spaceship. And we're going to go back now. Close your eyes once more into time. And we're going to go back one, two, three years in time. And now you can open your eyes again. And now we're looking at October of 2021. And we now want to get a little bit more specific on how we're going to see that vision accomplished. And so we want to define in positive and possible terms what some of the goals might be. So what do you think some of the goals might be in order for us on our path of creating a world without orphans that will lead us to accomplish the vision we have in our North Star? We want goals that are both positive and possible. So these are pretty broad-based, arching kind of ideas. Now we want to bring it down a level and get a little bit more specific. What do you think we need to do, for example, to support the families? How do you support a family? Financially, you might have some financial support. Other thoughts about how you'd support a family? Education would be another good idea, wouldn't it? To let them know that you're out there and you're prepared to help them and that you've got some resources you might be able to assist them with to help. Mentorship, Mentorship? sure. We want to encourage other people to be able to move forward on our vision with us. So if we can mentor and train them up in order that we can spread this gospel around, that's going to do nothing but help us towards our goal. How about linking with churches? What do we have to do to strengthen those bonds? 
Evangelize? Sure. Who would we be talking to? Ah, so we're going to connect the leadership with the organization and with the churches and any other NGOs maybe that are operating in your community? that specific. You could be specific in terms of an increase of 14 foster homes. Right? Because then you can measure that. A goal you can measure. Okay? I'm just throwing that out. I mean, you, you people have to decide their own. But when you say financial support available for families, are you going to say there's a pool of money? We have a bucket of money. Like something like this, right? money that families can draw on. <laughs> yes, Anton. Uh, quick question and suggestion. If we have time, can we sometimes uh, go back to like having a si something similar for an individual individual child? Absolutely. Like, I'm just, just like throwing yeah, examples absolutely. sometimes. Yes, throw a, throw a child specific example out then, Anton. Throw one out. What would you do if, you, if one of the girls that you were working with, what would be in three years a positive possible goal for that child? Like achieving a certain level of like education? Yes, like uh, complete grade 12. Mm -hmm. Let's just say that. Complete. This was Sorry? successfully complete. Okay. <laughs> this was used initially with the individuals. So yeah. for example, right? in the area that I worked where you were dealing with persons with disabilities, you might have very tangible goals. If your goal is to work towards independent living, uh, away from a group home in their own apartment, then you need to teach them the skills necessary to do the laundry, to do the cooking, to take transportation. So those would be some of the goals that might be there that relate to the overarching goal of establishing individual independence. Or get a job for a child. I'm just asking for supporting families. Yes. So we assume we know how to support the families. Or is there a step of asking the right questions? Yes. You, I would be strongly urging, yeah, that yeah that, that's part of your homework, but that's part of the interaction with the group when you're doing the path, is you're saying, okay, you need some supports. What do those supports look like? In this example, it was financial supports. It might be something totally different. Yeah, one of the key supports that was often required where we worked was respite services. If you have individuals who you are caring for, it can be a tough road to hope and it can be tiring, and it can be draining. And if you are parents of kids with disabilities, and you're constantly there 24 seven, it's nice to have a break. Yep. And so having paid staff or volunteer staff or people from your church that are prepared to go in and say, hey mom and dad, you need a night out. I'm gonna be here, I'm gonna look after your kids. You go on a date. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't that be something special? Doesn't cost you anything. A little bit of goodwill. Mm. But boy, for those parents who are struggling and need that breakaway, it's a wonderful gift. And one of the key things that often happens, or sad things, I guess, is where there's a lot of stress dealing with kids with disabilities or kids who have behavior problems or even kids who are adopted and come in with uh, trauma-related uh, issues, it can break families apart. And so that's the kind of support that really can make a difference. Again, a no-cost alternative. Okay, we're going to get I you back. I actually put another one there because it was kind of fitting when you were talking about orphanages transformed. Maybe one of your positive possible goals in three years could one of your local orphanages be, rather than housing 14 kids or 4,000 kids in one area, maybe two wings get transformed into a family unit. Mm -hmm. Right? Where you would have a mom and dad in that wing with 12 kids as opposed to 
other staff. So it's almost, you're creating a family home within an institutional, it's just an idea. I mean, I'm just throwing those things out. Um, but that might be a very specific, that you can measure that, right? Right, I'm not closing an orphanage, but I'm kind of in three years, could we change? Rejig it? That might be pos positive. Possible. And that was exactly how Manitoba transitioned out of its institutional care for persons with disabilities, is by doing that kind of proactive planning and slowly closing and moving individuals into the community. I'm going to have to get you back into your spaceship once more. Close your eyes, and we're going to go back in time, and we're going to go to October 2019. We are going to look at now. And the now piece is really important because you can see we have our North Star way down here and our goals way down here that we want to get to this place. But you notice anything? We're here and we got a big gap. So the question on our roadmap, on our path, is how do we get from where we are currently to the place that we want to be? And so we need to take a very hard look at ourselves and be honest with ourselves and figure out what our services look like today. Any suggestions? We have lots of orphanages in the communities that you work in. Do we have lots of alternative care options? Some? Okay, we have a a high need, lots of vulnerable children in the communities. Is that a fairly safe consensus from the group? Yeah. yeah, again, depending on the context, like we went into India, and India, as it was mentioned the other day, there's something like 30 million orphans. Well, I live in Canada. The population of Canada is about 33 million people. So it would be like every man, woman, and child in Canada being an orphan. The task is huge. But we've got to start somewhere. And we're going to do it by looking at what we're doing now. Do you have any programs operating now? Do you provide any supports to families? What would they be? Skills training. So we're currently offering skills training. Entrepreneurship opportunities. <laughs> what is the name of the program that skills training? That's what you would put there. Yeah. Excellent. Yes, you were saying entrepreneurship, the name of your program? Women entrepreneurship. Women entrepreneurship. What was the comment about, did I hear? Sure, absolutely. We've got to have some fun in having leisure opportunities and recreational opportunities for our kids and for our families and what have you is a good thing. Other things that people are doing now, like if you picked your favorite program from your organization right now, what would it be? A health care program. Making sure that kids are healthy and moms are healthy. How about any nutritional food kind of programs? Do you do any feeding type of programs? Okay, we've got that. What other, do you offer any counseling services? Oh, you do, do you? Some information on how to parent. What about information on trauma? Are any of you doing any trauma training? Okay. So those are some of the examples, again, of identifying where you are now and those are good things that are going to help lead you towards that goal in the North Star. Two seconds. Let's do it from an individual perspective. Okay? A child. Give me what something on uh, Oh, I said okay. That's good. Okay. Let's oh. for you. My child is in grade what? Grade 10 now. Okay? Uh, my child uh, has only one friend. And so one of those positive possible goals up here might be that my child has, in, in three years, my child has six good friends. If we right? do that for do a child, we do that with the child, right? Absolutely. Yeah, the child should be part of this process. Now, if you're doing this 
for a child, would you use this word? What word? Would you put only in there? No, no. way. That would sound awful, wouldn't it? You want it to be straight face. So you say, um, has a friend, Susie. Okay, so we're flipping between doing planning for an organization and doing planning for an individual. But that's, when you're doing a path, you're going to be focused on, I might plan what are the for other? this organization or am I planning for this child? Right? But I want to be able to show you how you can do that sort of thing. You, for an, another child on the now thing, you could say that, um, what other is for Well, if you have, again, an individual who's looking towards independent living, is can they make their bed? Can they burn toast? If they can, great. If they can't, then we need to be able to teach them those independent living skills if they're going to move forward. Okay, so you can have some tutoring required in order to make sure that the individual graduates and has the opportunities that they need to look forward to in the future. And when you're back home, you're going to be working with a contiguous group, like a group from an organization or a group from a family. And so they're going to be able to enrich each of these steps a little bit because we don't know your circumstances. We're having to pull that out. But if you're working with an organization that you know or with a community that you know or with a family that you know, this process is going to be even uh, easier to work with. So we've got a pretty good picture of now, what we're doing. We know what we want to get to. So let's take a look at the next step in the process. Who do we need to enroll? Involve. Are there any people that we need to help with this? Or does this happen without people? We'll just, I'm making up a name. Oh. Oh. I, I, I think we're going to need the tutor that's going to help. Right. Who's that tutor going to be? Is it somebody from the school system? Is it somebody from within the church system that's really good at math and can help this child to grow in their math skills? Who is that going to be? And you're going to see as we go through it, we want to be as specific as possible. So we want to uh, call it a tutor, but if you know the name of the tutor, you're going to put down Fred. <laughs> Fred's going to be the tutor for little Johnny in order to help him to achieve this goal. Sorry? If you don't have a name, then the task will be what? To look for someone that you can enroll. And so then we would say, okay, well, where do we go to find tutors? Do we go to the school system? Are there places where we can look online? Again, you know your community, so that's where you'll identify what that next would be. We talked about a respite worker. Kathy's already got that up. Uh, and so we would identify who's the best respite worker to work with this family. Or since they're looking after a particular child or children, is it better suited that they have a male respite worker or a female respite worker? Do they have similar interests? to the child that they're going to be working with. So again, it becomes very specific to the individual. Yes? So um, the process is possible both doing a check and it says both lives and six churches. Yep. Um, oh, You'd name those six churches in the enroll. We wanted six churches. Now I want you to be specific. We want a Baptist church. We want a Protestant church, uh, you know, Pentecostal church, a Presbyterian church. You know, and we want to name who is the contact person in that church that we're actually going to go and talk to. And even better is we want to say who's going to go and talk to that guy or that lady. Because having it up there with nobody to action step will see it fail. 
Are you getting the sense of this as we're starting to move through how this might work, both for organizations, individuals, and communities? Yeah, do any of your organizations ever need money? Yes. Uh, some of them do. Yeah, there's from time to time you may need some money. This will almost always be Yeah, if it's not on there, then I'm questioning, you know, whether you're realistically assessing your situation. Because most people need to enroll somebody or some organization that's going to support the work that they're doing, unless your friend is Bill Gates. Okay, let's move on to the next step in the process, which if I click along, we're actually going to kind of do two simultaneously, the strengths and the barriers. We're going to start because it's positive and possible. It's how do we strengthen our existing organization to accomplish our goals? And I'll give you a for example. Do you ever need training in your organizations to better equip you to do the work that you've been tasked to do? So maybe training in trauma is required. Have you ever developed a training center or a foster uh, system? How do you go about doing that? So again, just on the training element, you could have a whole pile of different things listed that will help to strengthen your organization. What other things might you want to strengthen? If you looked and thought back right now today within your organization, what needs to get better and stronger for you to move forward? Yes? I, I think that's a great thing, and I, I'm kind of surprised it didn't come out earlier, because in most communities, one of the biggest challenges we've seen in our limited travel is awareness. People don't get it. They don't know what they don't know. They think that it's okay to have people in large institutions because they're being cared for. They don't realize that that's not God's plan. <laughs> God's plan is he wants people living in families. And so part of this becomes strengthening because we've increased the awareness not only within our own organization, but within the community. And many times the longest and most difficult distance that each of you are going to have to travel in your work is the 12 inches between people's heads and their hearts. It's how do you give them information that is going to change their hearts so that they now have a heart for kids, a heart for orphans. Because once you start to change their thinking, then you're going to start to change their actions. So awareness is a critical step, because we want everybody, as Kathy's drawing, to end up with a love for orphans and a desire to see kids in homes. Again, looking at the respective churches that you work with, do the churches and the pastors have a good knowledge of what you do? Do they have a heart for orphans? Because I'm going to tell you, coming from North America in the Canadian context, I think churches have kind of lost their way a little bit. Many of the uh, orphanages, as Kathy mentioned, have closed down in Canada. And I don't know whether it was the state usurping responsibility from churches or churches being lazy and abdicating their responsibilities in providing social care, but a lot of it's now left to government. Government makes a lousy parent. They're just really bad at it. And so part of what we in North America need to do is start educating 
people appropriately for what the needs are of orphans, of what the social service needs are within even our own communities, so that they come back and become active partners in the process. We've heard lots of comments, too, about the fact that North American churches, for example, send a lot of money to various countries to help with orphans. And that's good. But where does most of that money go? A lot of it goes into institutional care. Because that's the only model that they are aware of. And while they're intending to do good, they may, in fact, not be doing what we want to be doing within our communities. So again, it's educating them on that, it's strengthening the knowledge they have. All right, we're going to move on because almost inevitably you're going to run into challenges. You're going to run into barriers. I mean, we heard talk about lots of presenters who were unable to attend because our enemy was coming against us and preventing them from getting here. You know, medical emergencies, flights that were <laughs> canceled, people that were stuck in communities and couldn't get out in time, and all kinds of things. So you're going to run into that. So I, the reason we want to raise it, some people don't like to include barriers in their path planning. I'm not one of those people, because I think it's Pollyanna-ish, if you understand that term. It's kind of head in the sand to think that you're not going to run into obstacles. And so it's better, in my estimation, to take an accurate look within your community, within your organization, and say, OK, here's where we might have a little bit of a stumbling point. And let's figure out a way together to get past that stumbling block. So what might a barrier be? Ah. We don't have it. Other thoughts on barriers? From an individual perspective, if we're looking at a child, what might be a barrier? So communication? Communication issues? Absolutely right on. That's what one of the thoughts that was going through my mind. One of the challenges we had in working with uh, children who were growing into adulthood, that's always what happens with these kids. You know, they start out cute and then they become teenagers, but eventually they become adults. But uh, we had individuals who had some degree of vulnerability. So parents who have been raising these vulnerable kids for a long period of time are often really reluctant to see them move to the next stage in independence. Because there's bad things that can happen out there. But each of us, every day, takes some element of risk in our life. And we have to provide the individuals that we're working with the dignity of taking some of those same risks if they are going to grow and develop and reach the level of independence that they need to get to. So I just put different Family. Yeah, great. I also put things like that I often hear from families, like I'm embarrassed to ask for help, or even kids who are embarrassed to say that I don't understand it. I don't, I, I'm afraid to sound stupid. Yeah, right? So you can put that on. Great, great comment. Sometimes laws and regulations can be huge barriers. They can either be barriers because we don't have sufficient legislation to enable, or we have barriers in the law that actually prevent good things from happening. So that's the, that whole issue of legal and regulatory things can be a tremendous barrier to the service delivery organizations. That's just one example. 
Kathy spoke uh, about the Canadian experience where we moved Aboriginal children away from their homes. A lot of those uh, foster and adopt placements broke down because they were not appropriate and they weren't well matched. So now you had kids coming back to their home communities. Guess what? They were neither white kids nor were they Indian kids anymore. And so they were struggling to get reintegrated back into their respective communities. And there were no laws to keep track. There was no laws. So kids would come back, they were actually adopted into the state. They would come back, the placement would break down, they'd come back to Manitoba, and they'd say, I want to know who my mom is. I want to go back to my community. Tell me where they are. And there was no paperwork. So no one knew. So now I have lost kids, as well as traumatized kids. All right. Yes, you have Sorry. I'm just wondering, uh, as we we're talking about uh, transforming orphanages, um, I realized that many uh, staff, they have this fear of losing jobs. I don't know if they come under the barrier as well. That would be okay. a perfect one. Yeah, the fear of loss is greater than the motivation for gain. There's, 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 there's no spell check on uh, flip chart paper. But that is a big one, right? A barrier. I'm afraid I'm going to lose my job. Or I'm going to, afraid I'm going to lose my North American funding. Right? Yeah. Certainly we saw in Manitoba with the move from the institution to uh, community-based care, a planned transition process where individuals who were employed within the institutional setting were trained and they were then transferred to work within the community, resulting in very little job loss. They work now at a different place with a different organization, but they were still caring for kids. Now there was a bit of a screening process to make sure that people, the staff that is, could make the transition. Because not everybody who works in institutional care would be great working in the community. Okay, we're running short of time, so we're going to move on to the next one, which is, let me use my clicker, the first steps. Oh, sorry, we're heading down to the year 2020. We're moving ahead now, and we're filling in our path. It's starting to get full. Now we're getting down to what we want to see happening, not in five years, not in two or three years, but by next year, what's going to be different? How are we going to know if we've made any progress steps on our journey? So or are we just case, stuck in neutral? With this little child, it might be complete what? Grade yes. Or grade 10 or 11, right? This is in three years. So yeah, it could be grade 10. Grade 10. Perfect. It might be, in my community, I'm going to increase eight foster homes, or six, right? Little Johnny can now do his laundry by himself. We have seven respite staff who go into homes to give the families a break, who are trained up and can do this. Other thoughts on what you want to see happen within a year's time, because it's that important. It needs to happen soon. Yes? I, I want to ask a question, Mike. Uh, can we go back to the North Slide? Yes. Mm -hmm. So when you're, you're casting vision, basically, right? Like, you, like how do you usually limit it to the amount of things? I don't. So like, if you want for a kid to have like 10 different things, it's going to be What about 10 different things? And that's one thing about kids and reality. Don't even worry if it's possible. That's not, that's, we're going here, positive and possible. I love to let kids dream. If they want to be a movie star, I put movie star up there, right? If they want to be a dancer, I put dancer up there. If they want, whatever they want, that's what I put on there for the kids. I, I'm going to give you a real good, quick example of that. We had a young lady who lived in a community residence, and they wanted to be a rock star. Wow, there's a oh, tough here. thing that we're going to put up. So we put up there that she wanted to be a rock star. She couldn't speak. She could hardly talk. No, no but the, 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 you're thinking the wrong example. Oh, yeah, you're getting me mixed up here. Uh, so anyways, 
the long and short of it, we put that up that she wants to be a rock star. But you know, we weren't going to be able to get her into any big nightclubs in Las Vegas. But you know what the real issue was? She liked music. And she could play the keyboard. And there happened to be an old age seniors home within their little community. And so we made arrangements that once a month, they would take her and her keyboard, they would drive a couple of blocks down the road to the seniors building. And the seniors who get kind of bored sitting there all the day and don't have a lot of music in their lives. Deaf, so they really couldn't hear her. She sang all the Yeah, so being good wasn't even a prerequisite. But what a difference. She achieved her goal of being a rock star. And she was bringing joy into the lives of others by doing so. So sometimes these goals, they look kind of daunting and they look kind of goofy, but if a little bit of creativity, you can make them happen. In, a, in response to the question, Anton, uh, is that when you're de dreaming, you want the dreams to be whatever. But when you get to the positive and possible and the goals part of it, my suggestion would be to you that you don't have a laundry list of 35 things. Because if you have a laundry list of 35 things, the likelihood of you actually accomplishing that are pretty slim. But you may want to prioritize your laundry list of 35 and figure out what are the top five things that we as an organization want to do, you're or that not, we with this child want to do. You're not taking away the dream. You're just saying, Okay, we're moving along here. We're filling in. Now we're going to the very first steps. Yes, we're going to the first steps. And that's the thing that we're going to do tomorrow or next week that's going to get us started. Because if we don't get started, even you can have the best plan and if you never move forward, if you never take a step forward, then absolutely nothing is going to be accomplished. So you can even pick the easiest thing that's on your list and say, by next week, we're going to, I don't know, have a meeting. And we're going to share this vision with our church or with our pastor or with our funder. Yeah, so you decide for your organization what that first step or first steps would be. And again, what we want there, and we're not going to be able to do it in this example, but we want not only what that first step is, but who is going to do the first step. So we want to make this very, very specific that Lyle is going to do this by next week. And so now I'm on the hook. I'm accountable for the actions to make sure that the plan is moving forward. And that Kathy is going to do this, and that she's on this list, and her name is there. Okay, or Antoine's making suffer for his wife. Yes. Pardon me? We're not going backwards in time. We're, we want to go for. We have to hire tutor by next week. But rather than saying hire, what are you going to do? Susan will hire tutor. Okay? Do you, do you follow me? Or it might be Susan will, will talk to three friends to see if they want a tutor. Then Betty will get the money for. The, to pay the tutor. The tutor will make an appointment to see the child. Like that's, that's yeah. Or Roger's going to put it in the church bulletin yeah. and call for volunteers. Yeah. Follow me? Okay. And we're good at this stuff. Like most of us are good at the, I'm going to, somebody is going to do something by such and such a time, right? We're, we all have a million lists. Like 
Okay, we're going to look also then at a six-month period. We've arbitrarily picked these time frames as an example for you. You can change these up. You could have three months. You can, have, you, you can make this as fine and granulated as you would like to to fit the needs of your organization. This is your plan, so you figure out how best to do it. But these seem to be reasonable steps because you're all busy people. You can't be necessarily going back and checking, but at the six-month point, you want to, at very least, be revisiting your plan to make sure that some of the things that you've identified have been accomplished. You also might find at the six-month point, as you're involved in your first steps, that you have identified another barrier. And so maybe you need to revise the plan and add whatever that barrier might be. Or you found out that you need to enroll somebody you hadn't even thought of in the first place. So this is a living document that is yours, that can be changed, it can be modified, so that you can keep yourself, your agency, your child, and your families moving forward towards that end North Star goal. Any thoughts about what you might want to see accomplished at six months? Kathy's got five past tests in math for that kids that you're tutoring. It partnered with the churches. X and y. Okay, so of that list, we've got now a couple that are down there and they're solid. We've talked to them, the pastor's on board. We've made a presentation to their congregation. The congregation is really behind this and wants to move it forward. You get the sense as to how this works? Do you get a sense that this might be something that you could use within your organization, with your families, with your communities, as a way to move forward? One of the difficulties in presenting this today for you is we're all over the map, right? We're thinking about child specific, we're thinking about uh, an agency, a church, whatever. When you're doing a path, you're honing in, you're zeroing in to one area, one child, one agency, one organization. So you're gonna be much more specific as you walk it through. So at the end of the day, like if I was sitting where you were sitting, I kind of go like, I don't know, where are we on this one? Because we use so many different examples. But if you're doing the path, you're going to be much, much, much more focused. So, Again, this process works very well in a variety of different uh, situations. And I want to share just one story about uh, our work when we were in Ukraine. We went to Kherson. In Kherson, we had about 60 people that showed up for path training. That's like way too big. <laughs> and we're thinking, okay, how are we gonna do this and try to accomplish something meaningful? And we don't speak Russian. So yeah, yeah, my Russian is very, English. very poor. Choo -choo. Uh, the other thing that we ran into, which we weren't necessarily expecting, is that there was real tension in the room. Because we had people from the orphanage, and we had parents, and we had persons with disabilities, and these are people that didn't necessarily talk to each other. They didn't necessarily like each other. We had some organizations from one community, another from another community. And they knew they existed, but they really weren't too much into sharing because of some of the barriers that we talked about. They were all funded by different countries in North America, right? So we don't want to share. So Kathy, who's pretty good at reading the room, realized that we kind of were in the ditch here. You know that for every mile of road, you got two miles of ditches, don't you? So it's pretty easy to go in the ditch. So we realized fairly quickly, or Kathy did, that there were some issues going on in this room. And so we put it to the room through our interpreter. We sensed that there's some tension here. We looked at the elephant in the room, and we brought the elephant of the room out 
so we could address it. And part of the issue was, as I mentioned earlier, I'm a white guy from North America, and what would I know about life in Ukraine and what their services are all about? But by expressing that, they said, this seems like fantasy to us. This goal, like how the heck, because we figured out just roughly, Ukraine was like about 50 years behind where Canada was. And that's a daunting task. So when we did the North Star, it wasn't for five years, it wasn't for 10 years, it was for 25 years. And we looked at that and said, in 25 years, can you see yourself making some progress? Because the one thing about doing nothing is that you'll never get anywhere. And so that kind of broke the ice and we broke and changed these dates and times to fit their circumstance. Because we had a large group, we ended up breaking them up. We actually did six paths using this process. Each of the groups was mixed up with actual persons with disabilities, people from the orphanages, people from different communities, people from all sectors of time, so that they had to work with each other. The beautiful part about this story is that by the end of day two, we had six paths on the wall all looked like this, all that were positive and possible. Each of those groups developed a relationship. They took pictures of the path. They took pictures of the group. They were hugging, they were hugging and laughing and singing. And the weirdest part for Kathy and I is at the end of it, they had a dance. Now I've done a lot of training, but I've never done too much dancing in the training. But it was a wonderful thing that you saw by virtue of the process. things that we want to ensure is that when you leave uh, that you have an owner of the path. That who's going to take ownership and who's going to do the thing that Kathy's talking about. And before we leave this room today, we want you to take ownership of the path that we have created. You see over here, we're high tech. We have an inkwell and a quill pen. We'd like each of you before you leave today to sign your name, that you were participating in this path planning process. Because when you do this at home with your groups, that's what you're going to do. Because you want commitment, you want buy-in, you want people to sign up and say, hey, I'm on board to this. So before you leave today, if you feel that this has been a benefit to you, we want you to sign up the path document. But we're going to five, seven minutes for questions. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kathy. Any other specific questions around the actual working of a bath? Uh, for some of the issues like the law, mm -hmm. um, I mean, that's not really changed the environment. So, I mean, would that be like one long term thing or something? I can't see it happening. Absolutely. And, but by not putting it on a pl plan, you'll never deal with it, right? I, I would, uh, barriers to anything, I would be putting very, uh, lack of laws on here. Whether you're going to address it in that time frame, but at least identify what's getting in the way, okay? But, but it could be a deal breaker, so I mean, like... You know, a deal breaker, how do you um, think? That, the, that law doesn't allow something to happen. Right. Like you know, so right. Right. So, I mean, so that could be a deal breaker. It it might be. It might be. Or you might be looking at how did other countries do it, right? And maybe I need to get so and so. I I heard it. Um, I don't know. Another country didn't have laws in this that didn't allow for adoption, but now they do. 
What have they done? Maybe I need to, we need to partner and have a conversation with them in the next six months to find out what to do. I can still have a dream that we have adoptive homes for kids, but I may, it may interrupt my positive possible goal. Like if I put, I wanna have 14 adoptive homes here, and I still don't have the law, I might not get that one. That's not the end of the world, because we're gonna do it again, right? This process, and we're gonna change the time frames. Don't lose the issue. So, you, question and then Anton. Uh, can I comment oh. on, the pre on the previous oh, question? Oh, okay, sorry yes. Sorry for like, sticking into the line of questions. But sorry. I just wanna comment because what, what we found out is that sometimes there are things that we cannot even find like steps to make to change those. And, and we like fighting with governmental corruption. Sometimes we, we just look at this as like, there is no way we can do anything about it. So a step can be communicate this problem to every church in the country and let them pray for it so God will change. Beautiful. So you have to really be Amen. thinking like how you can be. Yes, and so that talks about that awareness thing too. Bring the barriers to our attention is a wonderful step. Yes. about the guidelines for the process, because often you get the, the dreamers and then the people just judge. Yes, um, yes. And how do you maybe a tip for bring that together? Because if people bring their judging hat, it gets very difficult. Yes. Yeah, and, and that was the comment that I made earlier about the dis distance between the heart and the head. Sometimes uh, giving the uh, people that are creating the barriers specific tasks to do, to say, you know, you really have some concerns about this, and you seem to have some worries about it, but you might be the ideal person to help us move past some of those barriers. Would you like to take that task on? Because it's gonna do one of two things. It's either gonna shut them up, because they really just wanna be yach and complain, but don't really wanna do anything, or if they're genuine about their concern, they're gonna say, yeah, I'd like to help, and I wanna get involved, and that's an area that I'm concerned about, so let's work together. Here's what you do. This is usually when the judging comes in. Oh, that's a stupid idea. There's no way we're going to be able to do that. Are you nuts? And you say, I want you to hold on to that because we are going to be getting to that challenge in a little bit. Let's not throw that beautiful dream away, but we want to hear from you in just a sec. So their ideas are still honored. The judging comes here because we do need to be looking at things sober second thought. Sometimes we have yeah. thoughts. Developing champions, though, is a critical task in this. We talked about leadership. Uh, we heard about it last night with uh, Nikolai and his role as the ambassador to children in Ukraine. Uh, we saw that in Manitoba. And guess who our biggest champions were? Families. Moms and dads. They said, enough is enough. We demand better. And if you get some angry mums together in a room, Going to, going to meet with a politician who requires their votes to get reelected, all of a sudden you see change happening in big time. And John, you had a comment. I have a question now. Question. <laughs> okay. uh, so when you do that with, with an organization, you do this whole bunch of big sheets of paper, right? Yes, yes. Uh, you were showing us examples of like a, if you can go back, actually, and show. Do you want to see the like, the example? Sure. Like a big piece of paper that we you were doing that for kids, right? Yep. You could do it for many, many different. Is that a summary of this? Or did you do the the process like? With this is this is sort of the process. Just yeah, it, those are the ones that were done specifically for either an organization or individuals. Little Johnny, right at the very start there. there. There's. So it's like a summary, right? You yes. do this like whole process, and then you summarize it into one. Well, they just, you, took a picture. they just took a picture. There are people that are doing this. If you have requirements, for example, to give plans to social workers and what have you, is they've actually taken pictures of these and included them on the caseworker file. But they also can translate that into a written document that says, on this particular date we met, and these were the people in the room. We were talking about little Johnny. Here's
here's the goals and objectives that we set for Little Johnny. And so you have, again, a written documentation that is kind of similar to what you might see on a regular case file. So they just took these nine flip charts yeah. and they just layered them and then took a picture. That's it. That's and, the, and the reason they did that was because they didn't have a really big wall space that they could spread them all out. So this way they were able to capture it in the training center room so that every day when the training center coordinator came in and sat down on her desk, what did she look up at? She looked up at the path. And so she could see. And for every staff that came into her office, it was a reminder. Oh, your name's over here on this path. And here's what we said, or you said you're going to do. Again, it can be a tremendous motivator. So you can see they put develop, who do we need to enroll, develop partnerships, and they listed all the organizations. One of the other real benefits when we did this with this particular organization is they had a, a lot of new staff who didn't really know how they were connected to the organization. Okay, I'm in the accounting department. How do I really connect up with the Child Healing Center? Or I'm the builder, or I just started working here two weeks ago. So this gave a way for people to get connected to the organization and to start to see that common vision. And we're conscious of time and uh, lunch is awaiting for you. We're gonna stick around, but did you have something to ask? Yes. Uh, I wanted to ask, um, what are the advantages of uh, when you're doing your work? Uh, going to the site and then doing the work for the site? Uh, We're conscious of time. We really want to thank you all for coming out uh, and for uh, listening attentively and participating. We thank you very much for that. We hope that this will be helpful to you. Uh, we do have some other sessions we've got to head to, but we will be around for a couple of minutes if there's questions that you didn't find answered. And again, for those that found it valuable, we'd love to see your signature up there uh, that you're committed to using path planning in your communities and with your children and organizations. Thank you.